それではヤルカス様よろしくお願いいたします。That was actually a rather hard act to follow.、Um, okay. And I'll explain in a little while why I think this idea of working on machine intelligence on devices in particular is so important.、Um, we also work on computational neuroscience, that is, on the study of brains, of biological brains and how they work, and the relationships between brains and artificial neural networks. And、uh, in the past、uh, year, year and a half, this has also led us in the direction of thinking a lot about machine creativity, about computers being、um, not only analyzers or, or well, computers,、uh, but, but of also being creators and generators of, of art and of media. And that's also led us to thinking quite a lot about the social shaping of machine intelligence and with machine intelligence. So, I'd like to talk about the following five things. First, twins separated at birth, and I'm talking about neuroscience and computer science. Second, about the return of neural engineering, so this is a little bit of a quick history course. Third, about the relationship between machine perception and machine creativity, or for that matter, any sort of perception and any sort of creativity. Fourth, about personal augmentation, and this Also, is extremely relevant, I think, for Internet of Things and for infusing souls into pieces of infrastructure or the built environment. And finally, I'd like to speak a little bit about bias and social shaping. Those things will hopefully make more sense by the time I get to them. So, twins separated at birth. This is Santiago Ramon y Cajal. The great Spanish neuroanatomist from the late 19th century. And he was the man who figured out that neurons exist in the brain and are discrete.、Uh, prior to Ramon y Cajal, there was this idea that perhaps the brain was a continuous network of, of wires that were all interconnected. And、uh, even the, the cellular theory was quite new when,、uh, when Ramon y Cajal was doing his observations. And、uh, he, he made Diagrams of different kinds of neurons that I think to this day are still unparalleled and, and、uh, artistically beautiful in their own right. We've been、uh, working along with quite a few research labs all over the world on a sort of updated version of Ramon y Cajal's neuroanatomy, in which uh, researchers uh, like our colleagues.、Um, uh, Winfred Denk, Jurgen Kornfeld at the Max Planck Institute for Neuro Neurobiology.、Um, they've been slicing、uh, sections of brain, of mouse brain, very, very finely and taking electron microscope images of those slices. And so if you look at those slices in a series, you kind of make movies like this one. To understand what you're, what you're looking at, you should think about the brain as being sort of like a, a forest with trees. That's been put into a garbage compactor and crushed until there's no air left in it. The, the number of, and complexity of processes that interpenetrate connecting one to the other is, is absolutely staggering. That's how we managed to fit all of our intelligence into this small space inside our skulls. And, and then, by using computer vision and analyzing these slices, we're able to make three dimensional reconstructions of.、Uh, Of the connectivity of the neurons with each other. This is, this is a, a, real,、um, a real rendering of a small fraction of neurons in this particular volume reconstructed from the electron microscope images that we were just looking at. It's still going to be a long, a long time, I believe, until the, the work in connectomics, which is what this field is called, really intersects meaningfully with work in artificial neural networks. But I believe that that time will come. 
And um, that's been an idea that, that has been at least half a century in the making, if not more, maybe 70 years. This is a, a diagram that Ramon y Cajal made in 1900 of visual cortex, which is the part of the brain that processes uh, images from the retina. And this is a diagram made by McCulloch and Pitts, two of the very earliest computational neuroscientists who are thinking about what visual cortex does with signals from the retina. And they directly related Ramon y Cajal's diagram to this circuit diagram. And uh, so those uh, triangles are representations of pyramidal neurons, as they're called, in visual cortex. And um, McCulloch and Pitts were the same researchers who introduced this notation for neurons with the triangle in their earlier paper in 1943, uh, which I, th I think was the basis for the logic symbols that we use uh, for representing gates in computers, logic gates in computers. Uh, the, the triangle shapes are, are physically the shapes of neurons. Those, that little circle at the end of neuron number three represents an inhibitory synapse, which today is what's used for not uh, on, on logic gates, as you can see in the, in the not gate to the right. These are NOR gates. These are the fundamental building blocks of all computers nowadays. In 1948, Alan Turing, who I'm sure, um, I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with, introduced the mathematical model that, that modern computers are, are made from. And uh, this, this idea of the Turing tape, or, or this uh, logical, sequential computer, was only one, of, only one of several models that he introduced in that paper in 1948. Another one was called the unorganized machine. And Turing's unorganized machines were, um, were neural nets. So, uh, you know, the, the title of his paper was Intelligent Machinery. The entire point was to try to design an electronic machine that would do what brains do. And, uh, and he had several different possible architectures for doing this, of which, of which one was very closely modeled on the way brains actually work, to the best of knowledge in the 1940s. And uh, there were further steps in this direction. This is Frank Rosenblatt, who made a physical version of Turing's disorganized machine. This is called the Perceptron. And he implemented this literally with wires. Uh, it, it was an extraordinary feat of, of engineering. And, and this, this very primitive wire-based brain was able to recognize things like triangle versus circle versus, versus square. So perform very simple sorts of visual tasks. Then the paths diverged. Uh, down one road went the neuroscientists and Turing's type two disorganized machines. And down the other road went classical computers that were based on serial computations, much like what pocket calculators do. And uh, so machines like the Manchester Baby uh, in England. This was uh, the first stored program computer. This is the, the thing that Macs like this came from. Uh, PCs, iPhones, Androids. Uh, these are all the progeny of the Manchester baby and machines like it. And the other path, disorganized machines, things that looked more like real neural networks, they sort of uh, fell by the wayside. And this led to uh, one of several AI winters, as, as they've been called. Sorry, that joke might not, might not come across <laughs> particularly well in Tokyo. Um, Neural engineering made a comeback uh, about 10 years ago. And the, the comeback was based on deep learning, which, uh, which I think has also become very famous in, in recent years. Deep learning is really just a return to these very, very classical models that are based on Turing's disorganized machines, essentially. And initially, they were all about analyzing pictures, just like the perceptron. And, um, the way they work, essentially, is by taking um, images and imagining that a first layer of neurons is, uh, is the, the photoreceptors uh, at the back of, of the eye, of the retina, and those connect to a further layer of, layer of neurons, a further layer of neurons, a further layer of neurons, and, and then training the synapses or the connections between those layers of neurons to perform a task. And when that training is done, we observe things like the way that the neurons in the beginning 
of those artificial neural networks respond to light looks very similar to the responses to light that we see in real neurons in early visual cortex. So these systems both are the best at doing what they do uh, of, any, of any machine perception system that has been made, and also we see real similarities with the way brains do the same job when we, when we look at, at, at how they've solved the problem. And that's one of the clues that makes me think that, that we're really kind of on, on the right path to, uh, to doing what brains do with computers now after more than 70 years of, of dreaming about this. Um, this is a, a direct comparison of deep neural nets and, uh, and macaque visual cortex, the visual cortex of, of, a, uh, of a species of ape. So uh, to show you visually what these, what these systems do, um, this, is a, this is a picture of a bird. One of the most fundamental things that, that brains can do is perceive something in the world and understand what it is. So going from there to the understanding that it's a bird. It seems like a very, very simple thing, but this is exactly the sort of thing that computers were terrible at 10 years ago. Now, if we use this deep neural net sort of approach in which the pixels of the image are fed forward into a series of neurons that feed forward into another series of neurons, into another series of neurons, another series of neurons connected with synapses, I want to try and explain a little bit about what that process looks like. So imagine that the, the pixels we represent as the variable x. So there are maybe a million x's in a one megapixel image. The w's are the weights or the strengths of all of those synapses in the network. And there are even more of those. There are billions of those. And the y's are the result, bird. So in this case, I'm writing these as a, a four, b, i, r, d. So you can think about those as three variables. And um, I'm pretending now that, that, that those uh, weights are really just multiplications. They're, it's a little bit more than that. But, but you can think about this as a, as, an, as a simple equation, x times w equals y. One equation, three variables. You'll remember from, uh, from your math courses at grade school that if you have three unknowns, uh, you can't solve an equation. You need to have only one unknown per equation. So in other words, you need to know two of these and solve for the other one. And when you know w and you know x, then you're doing what's called the inference problem. This is that inference problem running on a mobile phone. Okay, so this is a, a network that has been trained to recognize different kinds of birds, and we're just moving that phone over pictures of different birds, it's recognizing the bird, and it's recognizing the species of bird as well. All right, so this is solving for y on a, on a phone, which is, really, which is really quite an amazing feat given the state of computer vision just a few years ago. Now, when the y is unknown, we are doing perception. Of course, we don't start off by knowing what w is. The, the whole trick with deep learning is to learn all of the weights of these synapses in order for the network to be able to perform some task. So when w, the brain, is unknown, that's what the learning problem is. And I want to give you a little bit of a sense for how that actually works. So uh, this is, um, uh, this is a, a different neural network that, that actually has just learned how to recognize the year that a photograph was taken. Uh, when we train a neural network, we can train it to do anything whatsoever. It could be recognizing species. In this case, we train it to recognize a year. So take, train it with many, many, many examples of images taken in many years throughout the 20th century. And, um, uh, and it guesses that this photo was taken in 1951. It actually was taken in Stockholm in 1950, but it's pretty good. It guesses that this was taken in 1971. Actually, it's 1972. Pretty good. What is it doing? Actually, it's impossible to say exactly what the neural network is doing when it's guessing the year of a photo. Uh, it's probably using some combination of the color process and it's looking at the clothes and the hairstyles. It's using all of the cues that a person would use in solving this problem. So, imagine now that we try to solve for x in this equation, that we already have a known brain and we have a known output. So this is sort of like running this neural network in reverse. We take the concept of bird 
take the network that has already been trained to recognize birds and run it in reverse in order to solve for x. One can do that with one of these networks. And this is, this is one of the early results that we got from, from running this bird recognizing network in reverse. So you, you see an image of birds come out. And this is, in my opinion, sort of the, the root of the creative process, starting with a concept and working backward to produce something, to produce a stimulus that in another person's mind might generate the interpretation of the concept that you began with. Obviously, there's a lot more to art than that, but, uh, but this, this feels to me like the fundamental operation that most art relies on. Uh, this is a, a, an interesting sort of piece by, uh, by one of our researchers, Mike Taika, who is um, taking a neural network that recognizes all sorts of animals and running it in reverse with, uh, with a concept of animal that moves around in animal space. He calls this piece Animal Parade, and it generates a sort of um, Escher-like tessellation uh, of, of animals that never quite settles on any particular species. This is a, a map of, of the world according to this uh, to GoogleNet, which is, which is one of the neural networks that, uh, that is designed to recognize all sorts of different objects. In this case, flattened out into two dimensions, so uh, you, can, you can look at a sort of spread out map of everything that, the, that this network can recognize. And here we've actually generated, uh, in the map, we've generated hallucinations of all the things that, this, uh, that, that the network understands. So it's organized the space of animals into things that are more or less similar. And I'm showing here where armadillos live on the map. We can do the same kind of trick with networks that are designed to do other sorts of things, like recognize faces. Uh, our, our group makes uh, Google's face recognition engine. And this is the face recognition engine um, dreaming my face, uh, which is represented by 128 numbers. So uh, this is 128 numbers that represent my face when you run this network in, in its forward direction, um, being run backward through the network. So uh, none of these pixels started off as, as, uh, as images of my face. They started off as just uh, white noise. I'll play it once more. Uh, and this is uh, essentially a sort of daydream of my face that this network creates. Now, one of the things that you, you can see happening is that there are different perspectives on my face that are all mixed together. It's sort of like cubism. And the reason that happens is because these networks are designed to solve one of the fundamental problems in perception, which is recognizing that something is what it is, no matter what point of view you look at it from. This is called the invariance problem. And when you run it in reverse, it can't always make up its mind as to which point of view to use. We did a bunch of experiments in trying to use, for example, one person's face to guide the hallucination. Uh, so this is uh, our colleague Alex Morvintsev using his face to guide the hallucination of my face with this network. And um, by using this process, we can make all kinds of very, very beautiful images. This is another of, of Mike Taika's that reminds, reminds us of, of, of temples in this part of the world. Um, it's, uh, it starts off with, with uh, random noise in this case, and it evolves the pixels in the image to be more and more like something that the network can recognize. And uh, in, this, in this sense, it's sort of like bringing order out of, uh, out of chaos, and, and the structure of that order is gleaned from the structure of the images that this network was trained on, which in this case was a very, very wide variety of images of different sorts of things. We can start not with noise, but with, but with, uh, with any image. So this is beginning with an image of clouds, and from here, feeding this into a network that's designed to recognize all sorts of different things, and then perturbing the cloud image in the direction of meaning for this network. And as you do that, the clouds turn into a sort of, like what looks, what looks to me like a sort of Buddhist fantasy uh, with all kinds of crazy things in it. This was the original deep dream process. Uh, deep dream, of course, will work with any kind of neural network. So if we take the face network and run it in the same environment, then this one sees faces in the clouds. You can also create a sort of feedback loop in which you take these hallucinations and feed them back onto themselves. So here, Mike tried something in which he hallucinated 
and then zooms in, hallucinates again, and you get something that is sort of like a fractal, but a semantic one that, um, that takes... And of course, after the first couple of seconds, this doesn't bear any resemblance anymore to the original image. This is, at this point, just a sort of free-flowing hallucination uh, with everything that this network knows how to recognize represented again in the things that are being hallucinated. I, I at least can look at this one for a long time. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should move on. One of the things that, that, that many of us found very striking about it was how many eyes there are in these hallucinations. Um, eyes turn out to be very important uh, for the network to recognize animals and different species of animals. And I, I have a suspicion that the way eyes look is actually something that evolved in order to be especially salient for neural networks. In other words, I, I think that the idea of the white surround and the dark middle and so on is, um, is not, not an evolutionary accident, but something that, uh, that is specifically tuned for networks to, uh, to respond strongly to. Now, I've given many, many visual examples. Uh, one can use these same techniques with things that are not visual. Uh, this is one of, our, one of our artist collaborators, Ross Goodwin, uh, who made a, a, really, a really cool device that uh, takes photos, so there's a, there's a camera on his chest, and uh, those photos are sent to a computer that generates poetry based on what was in the photo. So this is a recurrent neural network, a slightly different kind of architecture from the one we've been talking about, but the poetry gets printed out on thermal paper uh, on, on, his, uh, on his hip, so this is sort of like a... Um, a visual poetry generator. It, it puts a, an ASCII image of the, of the photo at the top. And this is poetry generated entirely by, by the machine, uh, trained on a large corpus of 20th century poetry. And it's, it's sort of not bad, actually. <laughs> um, and using that machine, of course, you can turn on poetry sort of like a tap uh, in the bath and, and generate reams and reams of it, which might cause us a little bit of anxiety, or might cause us to think for a moment about what it means for something to be art, or what it means for something to be creativity. Uh, when, when, um, when I first saw some of these kinds of things, uh, I, I thought about Walter Benjamin's essay in the 1930s, Art in the Age of mechanical reproduction, which in a more modern translation is translated as art in the age of its technological reproducibility. Uh, Benjamin was writing about mass media, about the idea that, that art, which had been the province of the rich, it had been something that existed in unique artifacts that were physically embodied and that there was one of that might be a, a painting hanging in a rich person's house, that art was being dematerialized in an interesting way. Uh, that things like newspapers and film and lithography meant that even the idea of an original or an authentic piece was being uh, sort of culturally diffused. And I think that led to a bit of a crisis in thinking about what it meant for something to be art or to be creative. And I think that this is a similar sort of challenge to the ideas of art and capitalism and democratization and so on. And we could spend a long time talking about just this aspect of things. But, um, but effectively, all of this is about taking different stages of the process of production and reproduction and figuring out how to do all of those with computational or industrial processes. And, and now, these processes have worked their way all the way up to the things that are happening inside our brains. So, uh, you know, I think that we need to let go of the idea that there is something uh, exceptional, something unique about the human brain, the human body. It's a, a process of letting go that I think we've been in for many hundreds of years, whether this was about vitalism and the idea of understanding that the molecules that we're made out of are, are, the, are the same molecules that can be synthesized with organic chemistry, or the process of realizing that uh, our brains do in fact generate mind, uh, or in this case, the, the, the idea that, uh, that creative output, creative process is something that we can make artificial neural networks do in just the same way conceptually that we do it ourselves. So um, I, I think I'll, I'll skip this it's a little bit of a tangent. 
Um, are these things intelligent yet? No. Uh, everything that I've shown you is a specialized neural net that's designed for doing some very specific thing. It's not a general artificial intelligence uh, of the sort that you could have a good conversation with or take out to coffee. But I also think that um, these systems are already brain-like. They're already modeled uh, architecturally after, the, after real brains. And in that sense, I, I don't think that it'll be long before we have um, systems that do have all of the properties that, that, that we have as generally intelligent beings. So we're getting there. Let's talk a little bit about what that means uh, and about personal augmentation. So um, this is a man who is comfortable uh, with the idea of an artificial intelligence experiencing the world with him uh, and being in the loop with respect to his own experiences. And uh, I, think that, I think that this world is probably just around the corner. Uh, for some of us, maybe it's already here. Uh, I also think that to the extent that, that those intelligences can live locally on the device and can be extensions of one's own body, then one can see that as an augmentation or an enhancement of humans. To the extent that those things become part of our built environment, one can see those as augmentations or extensions of cities and of environments. I think that the promise of that is not only in having everything get its own IP address and being constantly connected to the internet, but also in having the possibility of intelligence that can run right at the point of interaction with the world, locally. And it's that local intelligence that turns this picture of augmentation into one that can, in my opinion, be highly personal and not only central or institutional. And I would say the same argument is true of intelligences that we embed into the built infrastructure. One of the big challenges with local neural nets or, inf or uh, neural nets that run on devices is that the entire model for how we think about training neural nets today relies on taking all of the data, all of the training data, and gathering it in one place so that very large-scale computation can learn from all of those data and generate a next generation of the neural net. One of the things that I'm, I'm very proud of that we've been working on in the team for more than two years now is this approach to machine learning, to the generation of these neural nets that is also itself distributed. And, and so this was, uh, this was this paper that we, that we put out in February of 2016, and, and there's been quite a lot of work since, uh, that involves uh, not only having networks that run on mobile devices, for example, and that are frozen in place, but to also uh, think about how all of the learning and the training can happen in a distributed fashion as well. Now, uh, I have two minutes left, according to the timer. I'd like to say a couple of last words about bias and social shaping. When Walter Benjamin was writing Art in the Age of its technological reproducibility, he was living in a world in which people were creating mass media, reflecting their own programming, and then in this role they were called producers, and other people were programmed by the media that they were exposed to, and in that role they were called consumers. And there's a sort of feedback loop, obviously, between these things. What do I mean by people being programmed by the media they're exposed to? Well. Um, I mean that if you interrogate your own programming with things like the implicit association test, which uh, Harvard put online a number of years ago, this is uh, Project Implicit, uh, you'll, you'll understand something about the way you've been programmed by society and by media. Uh, there's a disclaimer, you can take this test online, and there is a disclaimer at the, be at the beginning of it saying essentially, if you're a good and decent human being, you're not going to like what you learn about yourself when you take this test. The way it works, uh, there are many of them, but this is the one for race. It's very simple. Uh, it begins with images of white people and black people, and you press one of two keys to say, is that, is that a, a white person or a black person? And then there are words. Uh, the words are good words or bad words. You press one of two keys to say which, uh, which it is. So far, so good. And then there's a mixed test in which the things that you're asked to classify are either faces or words. And it turns out that for most people, this task is much easier in this condition 
where the black faces and the bad words are grouped together and the white faces and the good words are grouped together than in the cross case where the white faces and the bad words are grouped together and the African-American or good words are grouped together. Uh, and this is because of the steady diet of negative media and negative portrayals that we've all been exposed to uh, for a very, very long time, regardless of what our explicit beliefs are about racism our implicit beliefs are something that are very, very hard to deprogram, and they're there. And they've been shown to have a profound effect on people's behavior when they're not paying attention as well. And uh, the interesting thing is that when we look at artificial neural networks trained with those same media, with those same collections of training data that we see out there in the world, they develop many of the same biases. Uh, the fact that, uh, that we are human has nothing to do with, with our development of these biases. If you're white or black, has nothing to do with whether you develop this bias. Black people who take the implicit association test also are shown to be anti-black in their, in their implicit bias. And similarly, an artificial neural net uh, trained on the web, on the Twitter stream, on whatever it is, on the environment, will, will develop these exact same biases. And we're in a, a much more complicated world now than the one that Walter Benjamin was in. We're in a world in which Big data are harvested, training data are harvested. Those things program algorithms. Those algorithms go into media classification, filtering, aggregation, and generation technologies like Deep Dream, but also like the ranking algorithms for search engines or for social media. And those things in turn program people. And all of these things have feedback loops that come back and feedback on themselves. And as we build artificial nets into our bodies, into our environments, into our technological milieu. I think that we have a very profound responsibility to think about what values we want to instill in those artificial neural nets. Uh, there are some people who talk about artificial general intelligences and talk about instilling uh, good values in artificial general intelligences. That's all very theoretical. I'm more interested for now in how we instill a lack of sexism, a lack of racism, and so on, in the very useful and straightforward neural nets that we're, we're generating right now today. And I think that there's a profound connection between those two problems. And by solving this one now, we solve the bigger one later as well. So uh, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Yerka. With that closes the keynote session. The reception was quite congested, and so we would like to express our apologies for any inconvenience. We would appreciate it if you have not yet registered to go to the reception counter to register as we are uh, issuing passes, and you will need those passes for the afternoon sessions. For those of you who are participating just for the keynote sessions, please go to the reception counter as we wish to provide you with some materials. In ICF, we have the 5G mobile communications systems lifestyle is something